Right, Matrix, uh, this lesson is on the nervous system, and if you are following in your textbook, this is on page 117. This is an introductory lesson, um, and effectively we are going to look at the nervous system as a whole, its purpose, and we are going to look at the basic structures within the nervous system. So the nervous system has two important functions. And the first function that the nervous system has is a need to respond to stimuli. Now, when we talk about stimuli, we are speaking about things like, for example, light, uh, change in temperature, um, pain, effectively the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, they are responsible for responding to some kind of stimulus. And the second function of our nervous system is to coordinate our responses. Now when I speak about a response I'm thinking along the lines of a response to the stimuli and so for example if you step into bright light after you've been in a dark room your nervous system responds to the change in the stimulus so the change in the light from going from dark to light and your nervous system needs to bring about a response and it needs to coordinate your systems in order to respond to it. So if you were to step from a dark room to a light room, your pupils in your eye need to respond to that change and so they will change in size and I'm sure you've seen before that your pupils dilate when they're in dark uh, light conditions and they constrict and get smaller in light conditions and that's basically how the nervous system coordinates your response based on the stimuli and there are lots of other different kinds of responses like you can respond to pain loud noises we're very familiar with um, perhaps putting your your hand on something hot or painful you you quickly pull away and that is your body responding to stimuli and then coordinating a response to it. And how does the brain actually do this? So it's a three-step process, and obviously this happens extremely quickly. Now, in order for the nervous system to work correctly, you need to be able to sense. And there is actually more senses than you think there are. Uh, senses are not just things like hearing, touch, taste, um, and smell, other senses that you might not be aware of are things like equilibrium and balance. And so what happens is the brain senses something and they use sensory cells and sense receptors and these can be things like your eyes and your ears, but it can also be your skin and you sense a change or something has occurred. The brain then needs to interpret this information and we call this a integrative function. So what that means is all the information that the brain is receiving needs to be integrated. In other words, it needs to be put together like a puzzle and the brain needs to have a, a large overall picture of what is going on, what is happening outside of the body. And then, once it has collected all that information, it needs to create a response of some kind, which comes back yet again to you respond to the stimuli and you coordinate a response. And so, once you've created this response um, through integrating all of the information, you then move into the motor function. And we are familiar with motor in that it refers to movement. 
And these can be extremely small movements. Um, they can be something like your pupil changing in size, where it can even get as big as, for example, your muscles in your arm contracting and moving your arm away from a hot surface. And so when we look at the broad purpose of the nervous system, we respond to stimuli and we coordinate responses. And we do that by sensing a change in the environment, integrating all this information that we've received from the outside through our senses, and we create a motor response. Now, stimuli can be physical, Things like, I mentioned earlier, temperature change, um, light intensity, but they can also be chemical changes in the environment as well. And that doesn't just include outside the body, you can also have chemical changes on the inside of your body. Now, the nervous system is one coordinating system that we have. The other is the endocrine system. And for now, we're just going to speak about the nervous system, but just so that we are very aware of how they are similar and work together, uh, the nervous system is your short-term coordination, and it's things you need to respond to immediately. When we look at the endocrine system in the future, we are going to look at slower, long-term reactions. All right, so the nervous system is divided into two main, uh, let's call them, uh, regions or sections. You have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And on the diagram that I have in front of you is just a very, very simple uh, picture depicting the two. So when we look at the central nervous system, we are speaking about the brain and the spinal cord. And a lot of people forget that the spinal cord is actually an extension of the brain. It's like the brain has a very long tail-like structure that runs through your entire body. Um, and that's the central nervous system. The second part of your nervous system is what we call the peripheral nervous system. And peripheral nerves are all of the nerves that are outside of the central nervous system, meaning these are the nerves that run from your spine out into your arms and your legs and your organs and basically the rest of the body that is not included within the brain and the spinal cord. For now, what we're going to do is we're just going to focus in on the central nervous system. So we're going to focus on the brain and the spinal cord. Now, if you please can refer to page 118, there are some very important diagrams that we need to refer to in the textbook, starting off with the protection around the central nervous system. So let's have a look, first of all, at how do we actually protect the uh, brain. So sitting around the brain, we are very familiar that we have what we call the um, cranium. And the cranium is that bony layer that sits around um, your brain, your brain case, and it makes up the large proportion or the majority, should I say, of your skull. Keeping in mind that the skull and cranium are not the same thing. The cranium is that big rounded dome section, and that's made out of bone. Now, sitting just below the cranium are three meninges. And I'm sure that you have heard the word um, meninge before or something similar to it. You've probably heard meningitis. And meningitis is effectively an infection in these soft membranous layers that sit around the brain. And in the diagram above here, there are three meninges. There is the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. The dura is obviously sitting on the outside. It's the outermost layer up against the cranium. The arachnoid mater is just below that. That is rich with blood vessels. We always know that something is rich with blood vessels um, or has almost like a web-like appearance because of the name arachnoid. And then we have the pia mater, which is our uh, delicate innermost layer 
And so these three layers make up the meninges. I'd like to point out in your textbook that the only reference to the names of these three layers and their purpose are found in the diagram themselves. So you won't find their names or their descriptions in any paragraphs. You have to find the name and the description on page 118 in the diagram of the protective layers around the brain. Now, besides having the cranium and the meninges as protective layers, we are also very familiar with our vertebra. Now, the vertebra sit around our spinal cord and in this diagram here, we're looking at a above view uh, from the top of this particular vertebra over here. And whenever we've seen these diagrams before, we've never seen, we've never really spoken about where the spinal cord is. And so this empty space that has been left that runs down the middle here is where your spinal cord will run through that. And so you have this very dense a vertebral body on the outside that is protecting your spinal cord and then you also have your different processes on the outside of that as well that prevent damage and so what you end up having is this brain case which is your cranium with the three meninges and you also have your spinal um, column which protects your spinal cord I want to point out however that the meninges sit around both the brain and the spinal cord. So please don't think that the meninges stop around your brain. They actually go all the way around and protect the brain and the spinal cord. So we've now looked at the protective layers around our brain and our spinal cord. Now let's move into the actual structures of the central nervous system. And there are three main structures that you need to be familiar with. And I'm taking this straight out of the exam guideline. Um, sorry, there are four main structures that we need to be familiar with. And so the brain is divided into certain regions. And these specific regions that I want you to be familiar with can all be found on page 119. There are two diagrams of the brain there, one external structure, one cross-section, an internal structure. And these ones I'm going to mention now are the ones that we need to know. We need to know the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the spinal cord, the corpus callosum, and the brain stem. Now, one that is missing from my diagram here, which I would like to include, is the medulla oblongata. All right. So if you look on your um, diagram on page 119, you should be able to identify and be able to highlight these labels from your diagram. Now let's quickly just go through very briefly what we are looking at and in a different video I'll be able to teach you more specifics about the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Very briefly, let's just quickly have a look at the cerebrum. Now, when I speak about the cerebrum, I'm speaking about what we are most familiar with, which is this folded region of the brain. It is the majority of the brain. It's where all the folds are. And collectively, I, I'm assuming that's what most people imagine when they um, think of the brain itself. The second section or the second region of the brain that we need to be familiar with is what we call the cerebrum. It is the smaller section of the brain. It sits in the back here and it is an older part of our brain. It has very important functions which we will get to in a different lesson. Then you need to be familiar with something called the corpus callosum. Now the corpus callosum is this sort of C, semi-C shaped structure sitting in the middle of your brain. 
and it's really important for communication between the left and the right side of your brain. Moving into our medulla, the medulla is the effectively the part of the brain stem that exits out of the brain and starts to move down towards the spinal cord. The medulla does have a lot of important functions, yet again I will include that in a different video. And lastly, we have the spinal cord, which is lower down here. Now, a very common question is, when does the medulla become the spinal cord? Because in a lot of diagrams, it sort of looks like they're the same thing, or um, we're uncertain as to when does the medulla become uh, the spinal cord, and, and, and how do you tell the difference? So the easiest way is the medulla is always above the spinal cord, so it's always the first main section of the brain stem that leaves the brain. And if there were vertebra in this picture, if there were vertebra, uh, let's say, if I could just draw it in here for you, if there were vertebra here, then you would be able to see the um, foramen magnum. And if you remember, the foramen magnum is the largest opening in the um, skull. And it is where your spinal cord moves into your brain. So where does it change its name and why does it change its name? It is called the medulla oblongata until the foramen magnum. After the foramen magnum, you will call it the spinal cord. Alright, so these are just the basics of the central nervous system from page 117 to 119. Please go through these pages. Um, familiarize yourself with the bolded words, which are mostly um, your terminology words. And also, please make note of the diagrams. You are going to either be asked to um, label these diagrams or give functions of um, the different structures. What's also very useful is if you're uncertain as to which structures on the diagrams are and are not important, have your exam guideline with you when you go through this topic um, because in the exam guideline it lists all the structures that are important to us and that you need to know very well and which labels are more, uh, let's call them nice to knows, um, but it's not necessarily something that you need to lose sleep over. Um, Yet again, please reach out to any of your respective teachers for any clarity on these ideas and topics that we've spoken about today.